grace, and peace to you all. As one part of the Church of Jesus Christ, we are inspired and guided by Christ's vision of God's realm, one that includes all who seek to love God and neighbor. St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church welcomes all people, regardless of age, race, ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, economic situation, family status, mental or physical abilities, to become part of the membership and ministry of the church. We welcome all of each of you, and we're glad that you're worshiping with us. I invite you now to light a candle, as has become our custom, to separate and distinguish this screen time from all our other screen time, and to remind us that Jesus Christ, the light of the world, holds us together while we are apart. Good morning. Let us be called to worship. Thinking we know all the answers, yet wondering if we haven't missed something, we entered this time to worship the one who is true. In the company of sinners, in cahoots with saints, we gather as God's people. Gathering with folks of deep abiding faith, Seated with those who stumble through the kingdom, we lift our praises to God.
the Spirit of Jesus, comes into our midst with authority, with a vision and power to expose the sin in our lives and in our world. The Spirit of Jesus also assures us that forgiveness and restoration to new life is real and present to us. So let us make our confession before God and one another. Let us pray. Almighty One, we confess that we have placed limits on you. We have tried to fit you into a box of theology, a box of rules, a box of limited human understanding. You've broken the world, even the universe, open to us again and again, but we still try to be gatekeepers. Oh, forgive us, our human faulty selves, for not listening to you, for not comprehending for not simply sitting in wisdom's understanding and contemplating your teaching. Forgive our selfish impulses to try to rein you in and put harmful limitations on others. Forgive us when we puff out our chests over what good people we are, yet do not notice how our pride trips those who seek to follow Jesus. Call us into your deeper ways of understanding. And may we truly love one another and love you, for this is what you have commanded. In the name of wisdom, in the name of Jesus, in the name of the Spirit among us, we pray all things. Amen. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Love is with us always, for God is love. That love has no boundaries or borders, no limits. God's love is with you now. You are forgiven because you are beloved of God, so much so that Jesus came and showed us the way, the truth, and the life. Friends, in Jesus Christ we are forgiven and sent into the world to share God's love. Alleluia. Amen. Please join me for prayer. Unstop our ears, O God, that we may hear your word proclaimed this day. Open our minds and hearts to be changed. Free us from the unclean spirits of worry, fear, destruction, and pride. Teach us, Lord, that we may follow you more faithfully. Amen. Please turn in your Bible to Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 28. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching, because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then a man in their synagogue, who was possessed by an impure spirit, cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit took the, shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. 
The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this, a new teaching and with authority? He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. scripture reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 8 verses 1 through 13. Now concerning meat that has been sacrificed to a false god, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge makes people arrogant, but love builds people up. If anyone thinks they know something, they don't yet know as much as they should know. But if someone loves God, then they are known by God. So concerning the actual food involved in these sacrifices to false gods, we know that a false god isn't anything in the world and that there is no God except the one God. Granted, there are so-called gods in heaven and on earth, and there are many gods and many lords. 
However, for us believers, there is one God, the Father. All things come from him, and we belong to him. And there is one Lord Jesus Christ. All things exist through him, and we live through him. But not everyone knows this. Some are eating this food as though it really is food sacrificed to a real idol because they were used to idol worship until now. Their conscience is weak because it has been damaged. Food won't bring us close to God. We're not missing out if we don't eat and we don't have any advantage if we do eat. But watch out or else this freedom of yours might be a problem for those who are weak. Suppose someone who sees you, someone sees you, the person who has knowledge eating in an idol's temple. Won't the person with a weak conscience be encouraged to eat the meat sacrificed to gods? The weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. You sin against Christ if you sin against your brothers and sisters and hurt their weak consciences this way. This is why if food causes the downfall of my brother or sister, I won't ever eat meat again, or else I may cause my brother or sister to fall. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now I'd like to talk to the children who are worshiping with us. I don't know about you all, but since we're home all the time, checking the mail has become one of the highlights of the day. It's really exciting when you get a real letter. And I've got a letter here and it says, to the church. Should we see what's inside? It says, love builds up. Do you know what that means? There's more inside. It's kind of a bumpy envelope. There's blocks inside. And we know what to do with blocks, right? You can build a, a tower with them. You can build cities and houses and play pretend. The verses that I read from the Bible are from a much longer letter to a church in a town called Corinth. And the letter's written by a guy named Paul. And he talked about eating meat. And that part may seem a little bit strange, but at the beginning of that part of the letter, he says, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. What the heck does that mean? I think Paul is writing to that church because they were having a hard time understanding how Jesus wanted them to be church together. There were some people who were kind of bossy know-it-alls and and then there were people who were just beginning to learn about Jesus. So Paul said, knowledge puffs up, love builds up. What he was trying to teach the people in that church was that love is the most important thing. Knowing things is good, being a know-it-all is not. Acting like a know-it-all knocks people down like a tower of blocks. What he wants them to do is to love each other and act in ways that build people up. And we can do that. All of us can look for ways to love each other. And if you're not sure what to choose, think about whether it would build someone up or knock them down. And always choose love that builds up. Let's pray. Loving God, help us to be loving toward each other in all our actions. Teach us to share what we know in ways that build up our community. And help us remember that you love us no matter what. Amen. In the summer of 1984, I was eight years old and the Olympics were being held in Los Angeles. It's also the year my family got our first VCR. Now, for those of you under the age of 25, a VCR is a machine that you hook up to your TV like a DVD player with big plastic tapes that you put into the machine and you re could record things off of TV. You could also rent movies at a store called Blockbuster. 
but we got a beta VCR instead of a VHS. And before long, it was clear that the VCR battle would be won by VHS. And in the video rental places, it was hard to find movies on beta. So eventually my parents decided to give movie channels a try, HBO and Showtime, I think. Of course, there were rules about what kind of movies we were allowed to watch, what ratings were appropriate. My brother is three years older than I am, so he was allowed to watch some things that I was not. But we had a rule and we knew that if we started repeating language or behavior from the movies we saw that we knew were inappropriate, we'd lose the movie channels. We knew what the stakes were with this freedom and privilege. We only had one TV with cable in the house. So my brother learned that if we were going to watch movies together, we would have to watch ones that were appropriate for me. In hindsight, I'm not so sure about the choices we made. This was the 1980s. It was practically the wild west for us latchkey kids. But at the time, he would not watch movies that might be inappropriate for me. He would have been fine to watch them, but he knew how to filter and discern and not do those behaviors which he knew were inappropriate. But me, I might not have been able to see those lines. And seeing the wrong kind of movie might cause me to stumble, and then we'd all lose out on the movie channels. Man, that sounds like ancient history as I think about it. I'm not sure I've ever compared my brother to the Apostle Paul, but I couldn't help but see the connection here. What attitude should siblings have toward movies of questionable ratings? What attitude should Christians have toward meat sacrificed to idols? That's the question facing the Corinthian Christians that Paul is addressing. And it sounds like a ridiculous out of touch question. Meat sacrifice to idols, who cares? It seems trivial and disconnected with our world. The food sacrificed to idols is only slightly more dated than a beta VCR. But the question is bigger than diet. It has implications for social identity relationships and belonging. The question is about what a community under God's rule looks like. And even details like what meat to eat matter in making genuine community possible. The problem on the surface is the matter of whether or not it's okay with God to eat meat that has been sacrificed to idols. But underneath it is an issue of what to do when Christians have differences among themselves. And it's a matter of individualism versus community. We don't even really need to understand what the deal was with meat in those circumstances. What we understand is that these people were trying to figure out how to stay in relationship with one another and how to build community. Paul understands that because there is only one true God, that these other gods or idols, they don't exist. Therefore, what to do about food doesn't matter. And that's all well and good for Paul to know, but many in the Corinthian church don't get it. Many, especially the new converts trying to understand what it means to be a Christian and struggling to find their place in the world, they don't get it yet. It's a challenge because they understand it in their heads, but their hearts aren't there yet. They can say there's only one God, but their hearts are still worried about those other idols. And so Paul, who had a reputation for wanting to be right, teaches that in Christian community, love takes precedence over individual liberty. To each his own does not apply here. So if there are people in the community who have these feelings that make them the believe that eating meat offered to idols is wrong, then love demands that their feelings be taken seriously, even if you know they are wrong. There was a group in the Corinthian church who thought they were smarter, more sophisticated than those people. I'm sure they were quite condescending because they knew better. 
Paul says, knowledge makes people arrogant, but love builds people up. Love builds relationships in the community rather than dividing. Paul likes to stand on principle, but he shows us here that we should choose people over principle. It's not just about what's good for you as an individual or how you understand it. It's about what's good for the community. He tells us later in this letter, in the familiar passage about love, that love does not insist on its own way. Knowledge and individual freedom are all well and good, but love should determine behavior in our community of faith. The health of the Christian community is the priority. Love builds up. Love provides the bond, the glue that enables Jew and Greek and slave and free and male and female in reality to be one in Christ. While the diversity of the church should be carefully maintained, love puts limits on rampant individualism. Paul warns that knowledge and individualism can be a stumbling block for others. It can tear apart the bonds of community. I realize that this sounds dangerously close to all the worst ideas about being politically correct, but it's not about tiptoeing through life trying to avoid offending the so-called weaker members of the community. It is not about remaining silent in the face of injustice for fear of running folks off. Paul isn't making a case that conflict on the whole should be avoided. Rather, he's saying that the church should be a forum for moral discourse. It should be a place where we can talk about what matters, but all of that should be done compassionately and out of love. The freedom that we have in Christ, the freedom that makes it okay to eat this meat that's up for debate, is not freedom just to do whatever you want. Christian freedom is grounded in love, in God's love for us in Jesus Christ. Therefore, if love is a matter of knowledge, it is God's knowledge of us that matters. Knowledge without love puffs up. Knowledgeable love builds up. What's at stake here in Paul's letter to the Corinthians is not just what is acceptable to eat. What is at stake is community and belonging. It is about reordering life to make genuine community possible. God frees us to live in community to counter the isolation, coercion, and despair that drives a world in which each must be against all. Because God is for us, each becomes neighbor to the other. Because God is for us, we are for each other. Eating meat sacrificed to idols isn't an issue for us today. But the practice of exercising individual rights while disregarding others certainly is. Methodist pastor Michelle Morris recently reflected on how Paul's words do speak to us today. Not about meat, but about other issues of community. She writes, Paul does not try to argue logic. Paul honestly does not care about making a sensical argument. Instead, he is interested in meeting people where they are. In the interest of keeping the body of Christ intact, he points out that, of course, you have freedom. Yes, but the right thing to do for the benefit of the health and wholeness of the community is to choose not to exercise that freedom. And so Morris reflects, as long as someone in our community can be hurt, whatever freedom we have needs to be put aside and we choose to protect the weak among us. So my friends, she says, yes, you have the freedom to choose not to wear a mask. That is your right. There are even a lot of us who do not need to wear masks for our own benefit. We have been vaccinated or are not likely to suffer serious effects from COVID. But as long as not wearing a mask can hurt one of us, like the ones who are elderly or have underlying health conditions, then we choose to set that freedom aside out of love for the ones around us. 
Paul says you sin against Christ if, Christ if you sin against your siblings. So how we treat each other, how we treat the community is how we treat God and how we show God's love. I appreciate how Professor Bruce Rigdon puts it. At the heart of it all is whether the church views Christ as one who teaches us to build fortresses to protect Christian community or as one who is himself the bridge to neighbors. It reminds me of the Nigerian proverb that was introduced to me last summer in a class. In a moment of crisis, the wise build bridges and the foolish build dams. What do you want to build? A bridge or a dam? A community or a fortress? Jesus showed us over and over again what to do. And Paul reminds his community in Corinth, with all the knowledge we possess, when, doubt, when in doubt, choose love. When in doubt, build the bridge, not the dam. When in doubt, build community, not a fortress. Knowledge without love puffs up. Knowledgeable love builds up. Choose relationships. Choose love. Amen. And now let us join in affirming what we believe as we say our affirmation of faith together. At St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church, we believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost being Christ-centered. The Bible is the core of our belief doing justice, loving mercy, and walking humbly with our God, being an open and safe place for confession and forgiveness, being involved in the community locally and beyond, being welcoming and inclusive, caring for creation. We believe that the church is the people. Amen. I'm glad to have you join us in worship. If you are looking for a church home, we'd love to have you join us here at St. Andrews. If you would like to know about how to become a member or how to get involved in the life of this congregation, I'd be glad to talk to you about it. Please reach out and let me know. I also, also hope that all of you will check out our Facebook page, our website, and our weekly email for information about regular online gatherings for study, nurture, and fellowship. Next week, our focus in worship will be on Jesus' teaching in Matthew 25. We'll have a special guest preacher and some guest leaders as part of our worship service in the morning. And then at 1.30, you're invited to a Zoom town hall meeting to learn more about the Presbyterian Church USA's Matthew 25 initiative. We'll be done in plenty of time for you to tune in for all the pregame festivities that day if you so desire. You'll be getting more information about that this week. And I know it seems like we just finished Christmas, but it's almost time for Lent. So on February 14th from 1 to 3, we'll have a drive through event. The Worship Ministry and Caring for Creation are partnering for a Love God, Love Your Neighbor, Love Creation take on Valentine's Day. You can drive through the church parking lot to pick up kits to help you observe the season of Lent and you can drop off household batteries for recycling. Now, as we turn to God in prayer, I hope you will remember those who are on the prayer list that we send out to our worshiping community. Remember those in treatment for cancer and those waiting for answers, those recovering from recent hospitalizations, those who continue to struggle during this pandemic with illness, Unemployment, frustration, fear, weariness, and loneliness. And for our nation, for peace and justice, for accountability and healing. Now, with these and other joys and concerns on our hearts and minds, let us pray. God of grace, you come into our midst with power and authority to liberate us from anything that keeps us from the fullness 
of life that you desire for all of your children and for the earth itself. Help us to be open to your presence, even if it means facing difficult circumstances that bind us and keep us from living fully. Help us to name the oppressive realities of our world that deform and deface human life and the life of our planet. Empower us to be agents of love and justice in our communities and in the world. Eternal God, we ask your blessing on our nation during these days of transition into a new administration. Bless our new president and vice president and their administration. Give them courage and keep, keep them safe. Help them to honor you by doing what is right, fair, and just for all our citizens and to heal the wounds of a troubled nation. We pray for them and for us all that we might serve the common good as engaged and faithful citizens with ears attuned to those in our midst and around our world who are hurting the most. We pray for bipartisanship within Congress and among elected officials throughout our nation as they grapple with the serious challenges that bedevil our common life and grant your church the grace to bear witness in its life to the reconciling power of the gospel and the justice it demands. God of compassion, we continue to pray for those whose lives have been most adversely affected by a raging pandemic. We pray for healthcare workers who work on overcrowded COVID-19 units throughout our country we pray for all who are facilitating vaccinations. We pray that you would comfort all who are sick or who have lost loved ones. Help us to be agents of your love and comfort for those upon whom the pandemic challenges have weighed most heavily. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ who taught us to pray together saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We celebrate God's life-giving presence in our church, our community, and our world. We offer our gifts in joyful response to the many gifts that we have been given. If you would like to contribute a financial gift, you can do so by mailing a check to the church or through online giving. You can find a link for that at the bottom of our webpage, sapctucker.org. Now let us worship as we give and sing together. pray. Now we know how easily we could treat our abundant resources as idols, holy God. So we will treat them as they truly are. Marvelous gifts meant to be shared so that others might know of your marvelous presence in their lives. May they and we bear your peace, love, and justice into our community and our world. Amen.
Now go out into the world to live your hopes and not your fears, knowing that you are held in holy hands that will never let you go. Alleluia. Amen. After our benediction, you all are invited to pass the peace and share a time of fellowship over on our Zoom virtual narthex. So as we prepare to depart from our worship gathering in peace and carry our worship out into the world, let us share the peace with our neighbors. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. Go in peace.